He was a child of the Depression, remember. The idea of poverty and want was very real to him. And he felt, and I think he was right, that cheap energy was a key element toward improving standard of living, you know, including nutrition and everything else that comes with it. Roughly one billion people live like the U.S. And there's about six billion others who wish they could. And they will as soon as they can afford it. But on the way, they're gonna be able to just barely afford it. Any energy is better than no energy. And the cheapest right now is coal. And if you look at what's built, it is coal. Coal dominates the market by 60 to 80% of all new stuff. Not just old stuff, but the new stuff is coal. I don't want a world that has 10 times as much coal. Thorcon is a collection of people who are primarily retired and primarily comfortable. And I really want to see the poor in the world get the benefits of having some energy. So I've gone over to India, I've worked in the orphanages. It makes a big difference. EIA is kind of hoping that maybe coal will dominate a little bit less in the future. But I think honestly that's a hope. It won't change unless we do something to change it. The ramp rate and how much new electricity we need is extremely severe. In the last 15 years, China installed more new electricity than is existing in the, all of the U.S. now. India is about to repeat that process. So we need to build out the equivalent of the entire U.S. electrical network every 10 years or so. And you know, once India is done, it's going to be Indonesia, and then it's going to move on someplace else. And that pace is going to continue for 100 years. So the demand really is to put out on the order of 100 gigawatts of power every year. 100 gigawatts of new power every year. This is a huge, huge market, the size of the whole oil industry today. If you look around to say what, what, what could possibly supply this kind of energy, nuclear is the answer. Uh, the shipyards already put out that kind of quantity in, in large ships, so they know how to do that. We can do about 90% of the work in the shipyard. This ultra-large crude carrier, the, one of the world's largest ships, was actually designed and built by the founder of our company. If you look at the world, about 80% of the people live within 500 miles of the ocean or a big river. It's a perfectly reasonable distance to run a transmission line. This is a one gigawatt nuclear island of a power plant, not the turbines and the generators and the cooling towers and stuff, but the nuclear island. And it's small compared to the, power, the, the boat. It's like one quarter of the steel. We're talking like 500 ton pieces onto barges, take them to the site, and assemble them like you're plugging together Lego blocks. This boat cost $90 million. So if I can build a one gigawatt power plant for anything remotely resembling how much it cost us to build that ship, then we're doing very much better than with current technology. We got roughly one-fifth the amount of steel as a coal plant does. For concrete, we've got about a third the, co the concrete that the coal plant does. Talking about roughly six cents a kilowatt hour for coal and about three cents a kilowatt hour for, for Thorcon. Should cost would be, if we set up a manufacturing line, how much does it take based on putting in the materials and the skills we have to put in, the labor we have to put in? Did cost is, and then what happened when you got in with all the regulations? So we're going to focus on what it should cost. The regulations are going to come in on a country by country basis and it's going to preclude us from certain countries until they come to their senses. The reason that it costs so little for that boat compared to how big it is, you've got a plate of steel on the bottom, you've got ribs going across here, you've got robot welders that are welding the ribs to the plate of steel, and you've got one person there running five or six different machines simultaneously. We're building the power plants using the same basic technology, actually in the same yards. So our power plant basically is a boat dug into the ground with double hull steel, concrete poured between the steel. Being able to build power plants at 100 gigawatts per year is very, very much viable. And once we get away from the thick forgings of the reactor vessel that you have with light water reactors. Every four years, we exchange our cans 
because we have a graphite moderated reactor and so the graphite is going to get neutron damaged. We have to replace it. And we do that by having sealed cans that we put on a, a can ship, we call it, a specially designed ship that will haul those back to a can recycling center. After we've been doing that for a decade or so, we're going to have some spent fuel and that will go to a fuel recycling center. We'll start out with just using simple fluorination and distillation to recover most of the salt. That'll let us recover the salt and the uranium and the thorium. Uh, it does not let us cover the trans recover the transuranics. Future, we would anticipate making this a uh, secure site and being able to do the transuranic extractions. This is a one gigawatt power plant site. We have, you see the can ship here. You see this little red one is, is a can. That's a 250 megawatt electric reactor. And then this is a standard turbine generator. We have no objection to break the cycle, but we don't want to wait. We don't want to do something that's even better, but 10 years later. So our goal is driven by what can you do now and get started, get going, because anything nuclear, frankly, is better than coal. So if we can make the cost and we can get there and get in the market, then we can fuss about reducing waste in the future. We're able to handle fairly flexibly what kind of fuel and salt in the same reactor. We're currently planning on using uh, NABI, uh, sodium fluoride, beryllium fluoride as our baseline salt because we can buy it now. Uh, FLIVE is a little harder to get by and we don't want our schedule to be dependent, be dependent on when we can buy FLIVE. So we've started with MSRE and we've made uh, sacrifices in neutronics performance, in somewhat in economics performance, in order to keep the schedule short. Roughly a decade we think we could be in volume production. That kind of schedule seems kind of crazy to people used to the nuclear industry, but I'd point out that Camp Century was built in two years. The Nautilus was built in six and that was the very first one and had lots of extra challenges being a submarine and all. Hanford was built in two years. It's by those standards Ours is a rather lax schedule. We're doing this primarily out of wanting to see things improve. Um, and it'd be nice to get some money out of it, uh, but that's not the prime motivation by a long shot. Go to India. They're happy, but there's a lot about their life that could be quite a bit more comfortable. Have water that's clean and running. Have heat, or in the case of India, air conditioning when it's 120 degrees outside. These aren't unreasonable things to hope for. And I don't have to be the one that decides. You know, let's let them decide for themselves what they want. I don't think me or somebody else in, in the US should be making those decisions for them.